aus und es ist mir eine Freude und Ehre zugleich, Oscar auf die Bühne zu rufen. Er ist Webentwickler, Typograf und natürlich auch Antifaschist. Und darum ein warmes Willkommen für The Technical is Political, Society and Resistance. Miko? Hello? Hello? Ah, better now. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, welcome. My name is Oscar. Um, my pronouns are he, him, his. If you want to address me after the talk, um, come do so. Um, I will give you a talk called uh, The Technical is Political. It revolves about around three topics. They are not strictly separated from each other. It's obviously about technology, but not about code. I will not show a single line of code, but I will really uh, more talk about technology, about its use and um, its misuse in the society we live on. Now, this society has evolved and changed very much through technology, and I want to show some of the, the ways it did. And lastly, um, I will talk about resistance, because I personally think that some of the uh, things that technology did with our society were not necessarily positive. Okay. So, um, some last remarks before I start, and I want to ask the uh, person, the PSA dolphin on screen. So, um, everything I said has been said before, and I'm not the one who said it. It were mostly queers or women or people of color, sometimes all of the above, um, who said it. And I don't trust you to believe me, but I would ask you to believe them. Um, Secondly, um, this talk is very much an introduction. I will cover a broad range of topics, um, but I will not go into depth into some of them, so there will be questions left unanswered. Um, yeah, so just uh, please keep this in mind. Um, and lastly, if you want to see the slides, you can find them at r.ovl.design slash cw ccc 19 or by scanning this QR code in the top right corner. Um, or after my talk, I will tweet them at underscore OVLB. Um, yeah, these are, I think, the opening remarks. So um, let's go somewhere. Um, I want to tell you um, a story. And a story that has some facts, that has some opinions, and that has some swearing, because I'm kind of angry at some of the things I will talk about. Um, It's a story about connections and connectivity. And um, as we live in the 21st century, I would kind of be amiss to not at least briefly talk about the internet. And I would, would like to start with a bit of like um, overview of the internet. There is a spoiler. There is no cloud. There are just other computers for those. Um, and so um, like most great things, the internet started from very humble beginnings. In December 1969, like 50 years ago, the predecessor of the ARPANET, uh, internet, the ARPANET, which stands for the Advanced Research Projects Agency Network, uh, were just four universities connected to each other. In October 1969, the first message was sent on the ARPANET, and it was low. Um, the connection dropped in the middle of the, of the message, which was sent from the University of California in Los Angeles to uh, Stanford. It probably was supposed to be login or lol, but um, time can't tell us anymore. For us as technicians, this is kind of a relief because even the ARPANET started with a bug, and every bug we wrote has some like historical predecessors. Now, from then on, things evolved um, pretty much. This is a schema of the internet from 1997 around, roughly, from the uh, Federal Agency for Security and Information, information uh, Technology. Um, but it's a bit oldish and a bit funny, maybe, but it still roughly holds up, even though we have no ISDN anymore. Um, but roughly, the, the structure um, is the same. We have like uh, service, internet service providers and we have content providers, like people who host websites. Um, we have the domain name system on the, the right side there. Um, and then we have uh, clients. And they had like the, the, the virtue, the foresight to make the internet a cloud thing, even though I think in 1997 this wasn't really, really a word already. Um, but it's only a word. It's no infrastructural reality. The infrastructural reality very much looks... Um, oh, sorry, Adam, I switched that thing up. Um, 
Today, we managed to connect more than 50%, almost 60% um, to the internet, which is kind of amazing given uh, the, the, the size of the Earth. But this also means um, that almost 60%, are, uh, almost 40% are not connected to the internet. And how they will be connected to the internet very, matters very much how they experience the internet. For us, we probably have this promise in mind of the internet This was going to give voice to the voiceless, visibility to the invisible, and power to the powerless. Uh, this is a quote from an article by Mike Montero, who is an uh, activist and writer who writes very, uh, very much about like, uh, technology and power dynamics and technologies and how we uh, have to fight. And I will quote him, him more often going on. Um, yeah, so this is kind of the promise that we maybe grew up or would, that we experienced uh, when, we, when we got connected to the internet. Now, quickly, reality check. This is um, more likely the central infrastructure of the internet, is deep sea cables running around the oceans. Um, this is a projection how it would look like by 2021. Um, you can see basically every continent is connected by, more, by many strings. Um, this is a graphic from the New York Times. Um, they ran an article where they um, explain the, um, the, uh, the technology behind it. And uh, I forgot one thing, the link for the slides, there's also an exhaustive list of resources. Basically, everything I say has a kind of going deeper article there. I will also show the link at the end again. Um, so if you're interested in something that I mentioned, this uh, page will help you out. This article, for example, is linked there. Um, but this, uh, uh, this uh, graphic also shows the yellow strengths. And the yellow strengths are cables that are owned or will be owned by Amazon, Facebook, Google, or Microsoft. So they are owned by, um, by private companies. And as we see the breadth and the width of, width of the internet and um, how many people are connected to it, it feels like a public good, but still more and more of the infrastructure, of the central infrastructure is privately owned. And I think there's, there's something clashing there. Um, and it is okay as long as these companies don't make their interests count. I think they will at one point. Um, and Besides the private-owned infrastructure, there's also another thing. More and more states are trying to centralize the internet infrastructure into like central access points. Um, and the Mozilla Health of the Internet report 2019 reported um, that there were 188 shutdowns in 2018. A shutdown is not a router failing or something. A shutdown is a region or a complete country disconnected from the internet, basically not being able to use it anymore. Um, um, for example, largely unnoticed in the Western media, the longest shutdown of, the, of a complete region is currently going on in uh, Kashmir in India. It's offline since four months. Um, this is the longest shutdown in the democracy of the whole internet. There have been longer shutdowns of single services, social media, for example. Um, but their like, whole Kashmir is currently not connected to the internet anymore. And this is just one of many cases in 2019 also um, currently going on. But even if people are connected to the internet, um, their connection to the internet uh, might look like this. They are probably and um, sometimes only experience, uh, experience Facebook. There has been uh, one survey by a researcher called Helena Galpaya in Indonesia in 2015 where she found a staggering number that more people are um, saying they're using Facebook than that they're using the internet. And she th thought at first there has to be something wrong with the numbers because obviously Facebook is using the internet. But they, they are so connected through Facebook, they basically just use the Facebook app and um, they, they are so... so and weren't entrenched in the Facebook ecosystem that they think Facebook is this thing. There is no internet, there's just Facebook. Um, now, if you are working for Facebook, you can say this is a success. I think that's dangerous as fuck because we know um, how magnificently Facebook managed to like, destroy everything they touch, basically. Um, okay, so this was kind of the basic connection part. The thing with Facebook centralizing access to the internet also shows something, something else, and I want to 
be a bit utopian in the, in the next um, section. It's called uh, The Web We Lost. And this is a, a quote that I um, kind of stole by Anil Desh, who is uh, an activist and an entrepreneur um, working in, in trying to build meaningful technology. And he wrote this piece in 2012, and he gave many examples, like Technorati, which some of you might remember, which were offline then by years already. So this web we lost might not be more like a distant memory for some of us. Some maybe have never experienced it. Um, and he starts this article like this. The tech industry and its press have treated the rise of billion-scale social networks and ubiquitous smartphone apps as an unadulterated win for regular people. Um, he goes on to say they seldom talk about what we have lost along the way in this transition. I want to talk about some of the, some of the things we lost. And I want to start with maybe an unlikely candidate. Um, this is Tom from MySpace, who some of you might remember because he was the first top friend we um, got on MySpace and stayed our top friend basically till the end until he luckily lost all our, da our data. Um, an unlikely candidate because MySpace very much feels like a centralized platform, right? We had just MySpace and we had our MySpace profile. But MySpace enabled something. MySpace enabled something like this, um, which isn't probably like the, the top of web design ever, um, but, and this is vitally important, this is personal, this is something someone built. Someone sat there and added HTML and CSS to their MySpace profile and made it their own. Um, they didn't necessarily own the infrastructure, but they owned the design. It was their personal MySpace page. No other page looked like this, for better or worse. My pages probably looked even worse, but it enabled us to learn CSS, to learn HTML, to get kind of entry point into, into working with technology. Um, to quote Mike Montero again of the article I aforementioned, um, at the beginning of the Internet or the World Wide Web, we kind of put our stories and songs and messages and artwork where the world could find them for a while. It was beautiful, it was messy, and it was punk as fuck. And how punk it has been. Uh, this is a screenshot of a GeoCities page, which was uh, another hosting platform where you could put your important or kind of important things on there and kind of work with, work with the web. Um, it reads in large Comic Sans letters, if you study the material on this website, you will hopefully un understand what our purpose here on Earth has been. This page is intended to be useful. It's written in smaller letters at the top. I don't know if you're able to read this. And it reads, welcome home. And I feel very much like home, and I believe someone had the time of their life building this website. Um, really, this, this must be a ton of fun to have, have happening there. And then some usefulness, maybe. I don't know, because I can't look it up. Today, we are more or less stuck like this, or most people are stuck like this. With the standard Facebook news stream, there's basically nothing we can do about it. We can post links there and stuff, but we can't make it beautiful. We can't, we can't make it ours anymore. And now, naturally, I'm a designer, so I've talked a bit about design and tried to illustrate this with design, but we haven't lost design. Um, to quote Anil Dash again, we have lost key features that we used to rely on, and worse, we have abandoned core values that used to be fundamental to the web world. Um, he goes on in this article naming examples where big technology companies were cooperating together to solve a goal which basically does not happen anymore in platform capitalism or surveillance capitalism. Twitter builds Twitter and builds proprietary formats of data that you have embedded into your web page for Twitter, and Facebook does the same for Facebook. And there's, there's no collaboration anymore. Basically, everything, every platform tries to, tries to win. Um, so we have lost... Um, the access to make stuff our own. We um, have lost a sense of openness, and we have lost a sense of collaboration. And overall, um, we have lost the ownership of um, our data and our content by mostly pushing it into, into one of the platforms and not um, building our own infrastructures. So I would go so far as to say that we kind of lost, lost our voice. Um, but still, the web can be a plethora like a intermingling of all kinds of awesome things. There are still very awesome websites out there. Some are like the all of human knowledge. Some are uh, like helping, helping out other people. So there is still awesomeness on the, on the web. Um, 
and the web can be a plethora of creepiness. We don't have to have experienced Rotten.com or similar sites to know that there's stuff on the internet we necess not necessarily want to see, really, that we maybe just want to forget. Um, but some of this is harmful, uh, some of this is harmless, some of this is harmful, and we'll talk about this in a second. Um, so the web really can be, can be everything. And I think that it's very vital that we, that we um, are aware of this and that we try to preserve this, that we um, fight against the, the uh, states centralizing the infrastructure and fight against these shutdowns, that we fight for net neutrality, and that we fight for open access to our data and our content. Okay, so it might be easy to say, right, the web is for everyone, um, because I just said it is, right? <laughs> um, but I want to rephrase this as, in a, as a question for a moment. Um, and I will give you an example. This is a uh, screenshot by, uh, uh, from a tweet of Margarita Stulkowski, who's a feminist writer in Germany, a very acclaimed, one of the, the most popular in the moment, and great at this. Um, she just published a paperback of her last book, The Last Days of the Patriar Patriarchy. And it took, I think, um, an hour until some guy showed up and asked, why don't you cry, babies? Just do your own thing. So, you know, without men, start your own companies and distract the men. Are you afraid of that or what? Um, and I chose this for two reasons. One, I have to give this talk in light uh, dark mode because of the screen. And when I gave the first version of this talk, I had just another tweet of her in light mode. I went back and the example I quoted was gone. So I looked at her timeline. and. She just posted this three hours ago, and her comments were full with um, stuff like this. And second, because it's really easy to go full or really on this and say, ha, ha, this, is, this is basically stupid, right? But um, harassment, be it physical or be it digital, is, isn't harmless. And why this example, the single example, might be easy to dismiss or kind of the ongoing torrent of hate and vitriol that um, women or queers or people of color have to experience online as soon as they are, are or as soon as they make their voices heard is, is, isn't, isn't harmless at all. Um, and often we talk about free speech and how we have to have, have, we have to write to say everything. Um, I want to quote a woman of color on this. Um, Tatiana Mack, who wrote Canary in the Coal Mine, one of the most Oh, let's first. Uh, she wrote, We must protect safety over speech. And she wrote so in the wake of the Christchurch attack on uh, March. Um, or not in the wake, in the aftermath of the Christ Christchurch attack. Um, and in this piece, she goes very into depth how technology um, is failing um, the endangered, endangered groups, not just on the, on the World Wide Web, but in the digital realm um, in general. If you read one thing I mentioned here, I would please ask you to read this because this is really, really, really important and great. Um, okay, so we have to protect the safety of those who are, on, are online about speech of those who are already speeching all the time and are very loud anyway. Uh, and as soon as you hear this, you guessed it, some random white guy talks, comes up and says, you really aren't allowed to say anything no more, man. I mean, well, free speech and all, 9-11 was an inside job. And I um, have a very simple answer to this, which is shut the fuck up. But with shut the fuck up, you basically are not going to into some kind of healthy discourse. So obviously, while you're correct, this can't be the, the end of, the, of our um, work against this. Um, we have to kind of talk about what is free speech, what enables free speech, and are you really allowed to say anything no more, or are you just constantly saying everything? And I think they are. Um, to quote Nasreen Malik from his speech, The Myth of the Free Speech Crisis, she um, said that the purpose of the free speech crisis myth, or the myth that you aren't allowed to say anything no more, is to guilt people into giving up the right of response to attacks and to destigmatize racism and uh, prejudice. She goes on to say, it aims to blackmail good people into ceding back space to bad ideas, even though they have a legitimate right to refuse. And I want to stress this. We have a legitimate right to refuse. There's nothing in the world that should, uh, that should have to uh, us stepping back and not saying something against the hate online or in the real world. We have the right to refuse and we have to use this. So yes. Um, the web is for everyone, but 
um, we can't let this hate that is online um, go unchecked. Um, and of course, this is not only a tech problem. This is not only a tech problem because technology companies are relying on uh, marginalized workers in uh, data centers trying to filter out the whole stuff and making this a very, very real world problem with all kind of physical, uh, psychological implementation uh, implications at that. Um, and it's not only a tech problem still because you can't kick ban hate. Like, society is no IEC chat room where you can kick ban people out of it and they are gone. This is not how, how uh, um, opinions work, really. Um, okay, so if it's not a tech problem, but it's a societal problem, it kind of makes sense maybe to um, talk about society a bit. I called the next uh, section of the talk the world we broke, and with we, I mean uh, white men. Um, I want to talk, start with one of the problems. Problem number one is basically that white people gave money to white people to solve the problems of white people. So in a very white um, society at the first place, by uh, constantly putting money into ventures of white people, we m still ever more centered, centered whiteness at the um, course of our solutions and at the course um, of, of the discourse and technology. Um, and basically everything else was discarded along the way. And there's just recently, I think, a reckoning and trying to get this back. Um, problem two, um, male people gave money to male people to solve the problems of male people. Um, it's to this day that uh, companies founded by women have it very much harder than companies founded by men to acquire some sort of capital. And if they do, they um, are faced or faced, confronted with a larger scale of scrutiny and um, easier, easier um, failing, basically. Mm. Now, if one of these things gets problematized, um, often one or the other of the um, employers or of the employees of such companies shows up and said, but we didn't mean to. Um, they didn't want to build companies that exclude not male people or that include, exclude not male people. And to some extent, I won't believe them and I want to believe them because if they would mean to, they would have just been full-blown shitheads. They would be like assholes, basically. So I kind of want to believe them because maybe humans are not worse after all, maybe, hopefully. <laughs> Okay, and that's, that's okay that they didn't mean to, but that they didn't mean to um, does not solve the problem because um, the problem here is, to quote Tatiana Mack again, that intent does not erase impact. It does not really matter how you intended your technology to be used or what your intentions between, behind building something was. What really matters in the end is the impact of those people that have to feel it. Um, and if they, if they feel if they feel discrimination, if they are discriminated by, their, by your products, it really does not matter that you didn't want to um, build a product that is discriminatory in the first place. Um, so, tech is not neutral, and it has never been neutral. Um, the technology we build and the technology we will build will always be, um, or can always be used for bad things. Um, this makes it necessary for us as technicians that we can't be neutral. We can't say we put this out there and then we see what happens, because then it will, then shit will happen, basically. Um, so we have to take a stand. Um, so um, in 1985, the scholar Joseph Weizenbaum was interviewed and um, he said, it is not reasonable for a scientist or technologist to insist that he or she does not know or cannot know how technology is going to be used. Um, and this was like 1985, 24 years ago, basically. But the problem hasn't really changed and tech, tech wasn't really good in um, resolving, resolving this so far. Maybe we can change this. Um, this brings me to my next post. I want to stress this, Facebook is bullshit. Um, and Facebook PR representatives who go on in, uh, news, uh, in, in publications um, after their ads found to be discriminatory and they say, yeah, but inclusion is at the heart of our company. 
Um, they are blatantly lying because the thing that is on the heart of Facebook's company, it's 98.5% of the revenue, it's advertisement. Um, and if they say, yeah, but Inclusity is a core, they, they know that they have, or they should know that they have problems, I don't know if they know. Um, and I say they are lying because the intent that they have does not erase the impact that their products had, and it's kind of naive to still think, yeah, we put something out there and it will be used for good. It will only be used for good if we care about using it for good. Um, but the problem with technology and with discriminatory technology goes uh, deeper than ads. Um, as if ads aren't bad enough in the first place. Um, but we have to um, ha be aware of uh, the use of algorithms, for example, to um, make decisions about the future of people saying who will commit a crime, predictive policing, um, and the reality that these, algor these algorithms are over and over again um, discriminating against people of color. We have Amazon providing the footage of the Ring home security cameras to police departments basically without any control over what the police does with it. And if you don't control police, I think most of the people in this room know that this might not end so well. Um, and then we have companies just focusing on enabling and modernizing IT departments like Palantir, who worked with the police and uh, HESA to um, build HESN data, um, a large-scale data um, har harvesting project um, with the local police, and they do this all over the world. It's not just the police in HESN. Um, and they also use um, algorithms to predict the, to predict the future. Um, the thing, the problem with these algorithms is, is the, the underlying models are wrong because the alg algorithms, they were given data of the past and out of the past they should predict the future. Now the problem is if you give an algorithm data from a racist past and it should build a future, the future is likely to be racist if you don't control your algorithms and this often doesn't happen. Um, it, for example, this is a kind of famous example with uh, Google's photo, uh, photos algorithms which um, discriminated against black, people's, uh, black people and were labeling them as gorillas. Google has pulled this off and still isn't able to teach the algorithm that it does not is like this. Um, the algorithm still just does nothing with it. It's so ingrained into the data. Um, or more recently, Apple's credit card discriminating against, um, against women by giving women with a higher income a lower credit score than uh, males with a lower income. Um, again, Goldman Sachs, the, um, the uh, bank behind uh, this credit card said, but we didn't mean to. But you did. You, did. you didn't mean to, but you built technology that did, basically. Um, so um, it really does not matter if you did mean to, and it really also does not matter if you put race or gender as an explicit input into the algorithm. Um, to quote the researcher Rachel Thomas, even if race and gender are not inputs to your algorithm, it can still be biased on these factors. Machine learning excels at finding latent variables. Um, and if you don't control your, uh, your algorithms, these uh, uh, latent va variables will result in uh, runaway feedback loops, so the algorithm over and over um, reinforcing itself and setting the next set of data on which it learns, and then suddenly um, it is so ingrained into the data that you can't do anything about it anymore. Um, to um, quote Nishin Yatsdani, who very, I think, um, concisely and rightly said, data from the past should not build the future. We can use data from the past to learn about the past, um, but what we're currently doing is trying to predict the future, and this has to fail. This is something that this data can't do. Um, and Tatiana Mack uh, said that the technology that we use is accel accelerating at a frightening rate, a rate faster than our reflective understanding of its impact but we still let the technology, or we still evolve this technology ever faster and faster and faster, and we still don't try to really understand what's happened there. Or if we do, we do it in kind of niche groups, but not as society as a whole. Um, 
this also is, I think, a problem because of the, the humans that have access to, to computers. Um, so I want to talk about um, means of production for a moment or a very short history of computing. Um, I want to start with a kind of imaginative thing. Um, so for a moment, please uh, imagine a programmer. OK, um, I guess it's very likely that you came up with someone who more or less plus minus the moustache maybe um, looked like this, a kind of white, um, able-bodied male person. And rightfully so, because programmers today mostly look like this. Hi. Um, but um, next question for a moment, um, please imagine a computer. And chances are again that you kind of came up with something standing on the desk here, like a modern-day laptop or something. If you know about the history of computing, you maybe went a step back and thought about something, something like this, this room-filling, big, giant computing machines that were doing less than the phone that is in our pocket, but was still like the, the, the history. I want to go even further back into the year 1892. In 1892, the New York Times posted a job ad. It reads, a civil service examination will be held May 18th in Washington and, if necessary, in other cities to secure eligibles for the position of computer in the nautical almanac office where two vacancies exist, one at $1,000, the others at $1,400. The examination will include the subjects of algebra, ge geometry, trigonometry and astronomy. Application blanks may be obtained of the United States Civil Service Commission. Now, this really does not sound like they were searching for some kind of machine, right? Um, and they didn't because they weren't. They were searching for humans, and more specifically, they were searching for women. Um, historically, and to the uh, myth of the 20th century, um, a computer was a human, was a woman. They were doing really complex and amazing mathematical um, uh, uh, computations. They, at Harvard for, Harvard, for example, they were calculating the, how stars travel across the, across the sky, uh, sky, and they did so so right that some of the data they calculated back, uh, back then is still in use today. Um, and the, how women were so synonym with computers that by the mid-20th century, computing was so much considered a women's job that mathematicians would guesstimate their horsepower by invoking girl, girl years. And um, when there, there refers to mechani mechanical computing uh, machines, and when they were uh, describing the units of machine labor that one of these machines has, they were describing it as a kilogirl, uh, where we, today we talk about kilobytes, maybe they, they were referring to kilogirls. Um, and it all started uh, with her. This is Ada Lovelace. Um, now, finally, we have a, name named after, a room named after her next to it, the, the biggest room of this co conference, and rightfully so, I think. Um, she was working in the mid-19th century, and together with Charles Babur, she um, worked on the thing called the difference engine. It was really an engine, steam-powered and such, um, which was doing calculations. And she's widely regarded as the first programmer because she wrote the programs for, for this engine. Um, now, going into the midst of the 20th century, it's a very short history of computing. Um, we, for example, have women working uh, as telephone operators. And when the first computers um, came up, they were like these huge things I just showed. And these, kind of, these women had the, the skill necessary to, um, to work on these machines. Um, so some of the women who were programming the, real, the first real computers um, that we know t kind of know or understand today as a computer were, for example, Grace Hopper, uh, Hopper sorry, um, working for the Navy during the, the Second World War. Or we have the ENIAC 6, uh, namely Kathleen McNulty, Betty Jen Jennings, Elizabeth Snyder, Marlene Veskov, Francis Billers, and Ruth Lichterman working at the University of Pennsylvania at a machine called the ENIAC, which is generally considered to be the first all-purpose computer. So the, they were calculating missile ranges for the, for the army, uh, but it's generally like this computer should be able to calculate basically anything. Or we have in Great Britain at Bletchley Park, we had the Colossus Mark II, a code-breaking computer, which uh, broke code, the Enigma code of the Nazis basically in real time. And here we have two women operating this, namely um, Dorothy de Buzon 
and Elsie Booker. And this continued well into the, the 1960s, I think, uh, where people working with computers were mostly women. Um, they weren't doing punch cards anymore. No, they had like keyboards and stuff, but they were mostly women. Um, and women also were among the, the people creating the first compilers and high-level programming languages, so the things we probably interact with today. Um, and then a question was raised, which is, what is a pro or who is a programmer, really? Um, it was raised among other things because there was a shortage of programmers. Um, and some newspapers at the time talked about a software crisis, was more like a labor crisis actually, and I think it still really, really isn't uh, resolved today. Um, and this crisis, or crisis, however, uh, went as far that the NATO held a conference here in Germany in Garmisch. They weren't including any women on the guest list, so basically just male people deciding the future again. And here they made a change. Um, and Claire Evans in the history of women in computing um, wrote, the most significant change they made, arguably, was semantic. Programming, they decided, would heretofore be known as engineering. The, 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 the title we probably use today. Um, the shift was on in vocabulary was a shift uh, in, in focus. It was more focusing on technical skills than maybe on the uh, skills that humans have to possess as the so-called soft skills, working with each other, collaborating. Um, but from then on, you have to be kind of an engineer, very like serious thing. Um, in this crisis, there were also more concrete factors at play, for example, a lack of childcare, a lack of mentoring, and of course, because we live in a patriarchy, uh, wage discrimination against, against women. Um, and so there were also other factors driving women out of the workforce. Factors, I think, that are still very re relevant today. Um, and these changes or these problems, they worked. This is an iconic Apple ad uh, from introducing the Apple II. It's from 1977, so roughly 10 years later. Um, and here we see... Sorry. Here we see the woman... Um, Back, into the ki back in the kitchen, doing the household and very admiringly looking down at her man who is in the front very earnestly working at a computer with some kind of economical data, so he's probably destroying the economy or no, as such, I don't know. Um, but this ad shows that um, in the public view, programming and working with computers was more getting more manlier by the day, and it still is today. Um, now, what we still have today is, uh, again, white men who hire white men to solve the problems of white men, and they hire their, their peers, basically, to, in their companies, and by that, um, uh, reinforcing this cycle, this focus on uh, a male workforce that we have today. And I think uh, we have to, have to broaden the axis, and we have to break the cycle. Now, there are organizations, like here in the club, the Hexen, or uh, Globally Women Who Code, um, who are actively working on getting more women and more non-binary people, basically everybody who's not male, <laughs> in, the, in the computing workforce. There are feminist hack spaces, and we saw a talk yesterday on the stage about um, feminist hack spaces, for example, the uh, Heart of Code in Berlin. Um, who try to make programming more accessible and trying to teach this to, to more people. Um, yeah. And what they do is, is fighting, and this brings me to my last, last, time, uh, last section, um, which is named You Gotta Fight. Um, we have to fight because I showed a breadth of things, and these are not the only things. I had to leave out such things because otherwise I think the talk would have been um, 45 hours instead of 45 minutes, minutes probably. Um, and I want to talk a bit about ways we could fight. The first one is maybe a bit unlikely. Um, I want us to be playful. I, I want us to work with technology in a way that is, that is playful, that's, that's fun. Um, because being playful is one of the ways which we, that we can use to reclaim the web we lost a bit, I talk. But it can also like very creating different entry, entry points into technology again. Um, Casey, Casey Evans said, keep making fun stuff in a talk about animation, web animations with SVGs where you animate graphics. Um, Casey Evans does stuff like this 
um, which maybe isn't, um, it's no real algorithmic magic, but it's super cute and super amazing, and it's code. Um, it's code that does it. It's code that makes the jellyfish go up and down and, and smile and like blinkle their eyes, and it, I think it's super cool. Um, and she also does uh, stuff like this. This is a blob that is a bit shy and stops dancing when you, when you look at this. Um, to do this, she uses the shape detection API that's uh, built into Google, Google's Chrome browser. It's available behind the flag. And the shape detection API has the ability to detect faces. Now, this kind of sounds dystopian if you weren't animating blobs with it, but you can also use this technology that maybe at first sight or at first sound here it sounds a bit, uh, oh, it stopped. Oh. Uh, it sounds a bit dystopian to use uh, to build good things. Um, tech maybe can be plain useless. This is a Twitter bot called EveryDNA. Um, it just combines two emojis and builds a double helix DNA out of it. This is the gay rocket DNA, and I think it was about damn time that we have this. Um, and <laughs> it's, it's use, more or less useless. It's, it's fun. It, it's built with a Twitter board called Cheap Bots Done Quick. <laughs> so there probably wasn't even a lot of time involved to build this. But it's still, it's still great. I love this. I, every time a, a wonderful combination of these pops up in my Twitter feed, I'm... I'm I'm lucky, I'm, I'm, fr I'm happy. Um, so to quote S Casey Evans again, um, in a world that becomes more dystopian by the day, we can also use technology for good, and it's important that we use technology for good, because there's something in this playfulness um, that's more than fun. Um, it's something about this playfulness that we can use to teach technologies and that we can use to build communities. And over the course of computing history, it were mostly not male people doing this kind of thing. So also to the male men in the room, please be more fun and build more communities. Um, and we can also use this technology to educate ourselves and to educate others. Um, we can use this to learn stuff, but we can also, and this is also important, use this to unlearn stuff. Not just forgetting, but actively unlearning uh, ways of thinking, for example, that we learned in a racist society and where we have to make a conscious effort to unlearn this. We can't just um, forget this. We can build book clubs or uh, communities in which we exchange uh, uh, ideas about technology, for example. Um, and it was Grace Hopper, actually, in 1968, who already said that you needed people with more vocabularies, and she means that we, we as technologists, technologists need vocabularies that are just, not just strictly technolo te <laughs> not just strictly about technology, to be able to interact with the world as a, as a whole. And the more technology builds the world as a whole, the more vocabularies we need, and the more important it is that we welcome people who know these voc vocabularies into, into our circles. Uh, one project that's very near to my heart currently is self-defined. Um, it's built by Tatiana Mack and maintained by our community. Um, a modern dictionary about us. We define our words, but they don't define us. So it, it's available at selfdefined.app. Um, and it's basically a way to kind of reclaim, reclaim languages and make languages um, not ours, because I'm a white man, and language is probably already mine, but the make language again formed and defined by the people who are impacted by this. Um, and this also brings me to the next thing, which is um, that we have to hear and amplify the voices of endangered groups. Um, we as white people have, our, have to use our safety to stand up for people who are targeted by racism, because we have safety and we have privilege in the society, and we have to use this privilege. Of course, also, we as men have to use the safety we have in a patriarchal society to um, to fight against, fight against this and use the safety. And of course, also, straight people have to use the, the safety they have as straight people to fight um, against homophobia, to stand up. If a dude in your workplace make a homophobic slur, then stand up and say something, not just sit there. Make your voice heard, because your voice is actually more heard. We can have to change this, but we, as long as it is, we have to make our voices heard. Um, this 
isn't strictly about empathy, right? Um, because empathy kind of requires you to feel the way the other, other person is feeling. And I think this can be a dead trap because I, as a white person, cannot possibly know how it really feels to um, go around the street day by day and be targeted by racial microaggressions or something. I, as a man, cannot know how it feels to have a Twitter account and be bombarded with all these kind of bullshit comments um, because I just don't get them mostly. Um, so, uh, to quote Krim Creighton, empathy relies on someone else being able to understand the suffering of others in order to do anything about it. And she goes on to say, we don't need to understand the suffering of others to take action to minimize their pain. We only need to be aware that the potential for suffering exists. We need to be aware that they are speaking up. We need to be aware um, of, of the dynamics. Um, and this is this awareness that um, makes it possible to consistently act. It's not the empathy because we just might not be able to feel this, but we can always be able to be aware. Last thing, organize. Of course, we have to go on the streets and we have to go and we have to take collective action. Not only if you're feeling, currently feeling the impact, but by being aware that others are feeling the impacts or might be in danger of feeling the impact. Um, we have to prioritize communities over competition because in the capitalist market space, we are all competing against each other and this is how this, this works. By focusing on communities and building healthy communities over this competition, we can go a step into um, into resolving this competition and um, making this a thing of the past. We have to prioritize communities over companies. Um, tech companies are very good in building, um, in building like a company community and basically all you have to do is live and breathe for the company and I think that's not necessarily correct. <laughs> um, there are vital communities inside companies probably and it's cool that they are there, but the company is not your community. The company is someone to, who has hired you um, to make money out of your labor. That's not a nice basis for a community. Um, and we have to f uh, f prioritize communities over nations. Um, we have to um, be aware that other peoples in other states are basically fighting the same fights we do. Um, for example, GitHub currently um, has a contract running with the Immigration Enforcement Agency in the, in the US, and this is an agency that puts children into cages to deport them and separate them from their families, which is a very, very evil thing to do. Um, and still GitHub refuses to drop their contract, and this is a rem reminder to anyone at GitHub currently listening, um, please drop the contract. Um, so we are in this together, we are in this together against nation boundaries or any other boundaries, and um, we can make this count. <laughs> I know. I'm running out of time, so I will quickly um, yeah. come to the end. Just in time arrival, perfect. I'm quickly coming to the end. I've yeah, so a uh, warm welcome at the first beginning before we start with the Q&A session. If there's uh, any... Can I, can I do the one last... <gasps> One last thing. Okay, uh, collective election will be challenged. Uh, we have to take back the streets and we have to make racists afraid again. Um, we have to, for example, build big data against technology. This is a piece from Wyatt. It's linked to the resources, which I will show in a second. Um, and we have to be like Rumpy Cat. <laughs> and uh, we need to act because if we don't act, we will look like a bunch of overpaid bollocks. And I think this is a very bad look. And I want to give the last work of this uh, talk to Rosa Luxemburg, who in 1990, 100 years ago, said, act, act courageously, resolutely, and consistently. Um, okay, so dolphins again. Talk, this is the slides. You'll find all resources there. Thank applause, you very much. Applause, 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 applause. Yeah, when it's jetzt noch. Wir haben noch zwei Minuten für Fragen. Links und rechts sind Mikrofone. Äh, wenn die Lichter angehen, einen sehe ich schon auf der rechten Seite. Hey, uh, thanks for your talk. And thanks for the uh, positive points you made in the end. Very fast. And, uh, yeah, but I think it's uh, hard to keep the fun and uh, the, the feeling of freedom in an Internet that we lose more and more to private companies. And I, uh, yeah, you, t you made the point at the beginning that a lot of people uh, look at Facebook and think this is the internet. And 
I think this, uh, the step is one further. A lot of people look at their smartphone and think this is a computer and this is the internet, but it's just a bunch of applications. And yeah, as long as young people get used to the internet through this, I think it is hard to break this feeling. It's hard to break. This is, I think, why it's so vitally important that we that we kind of have another feeling and that we have maybe have another approach to technology, go out there and t uh, teach teach people, young people, old people, middle-aged people, um, and make, make the point for an alternative and um, try, to, try to build something, something positive. And this is also where I think fun can be very vital to do this. Um. Thanks. Yes. On the left, there's a question. Yeah. Um, thank you a lot for your talk. I just want, like, if you don't mind, I would like to compliment on two aspects you mentioned. And the first is the notion of free speech, because I actually think rather than talking about which speeches should we allow, we should just be conscious that there's a difference between the freedom to speak and the freedom to discriminate. Yeah. And there's actually plenty of really problematic opinions which can be voiced without being upfront hateful. So um, I think this is what this is actually about that people go back to actually voice their really problematic opinions in ways that don't directly threaten individuals. And so I think, yeah, rather than just always mention this free speech and, oh, it's threatened, let's just make this differentiation really clear. And then the other point is about the disappearance of women from technology. Um, there, there's actually something really interesting, and it's um, that as soon as any kind of profession becomes valued, and that this value is reflected by actual pay or higher pay, it starts becoming a male-dominated yep. profession. That's and I just correct. wanted to mention that because, yeah, you showed how as soon as it was becoming engineering, it became a male profession. And like statistically, and this is true for all, at least I know that it's true for almost all European countries, we can really observe this phenomenon. Yeah, I actually had this in my speaker notes and didn't say it, so thank you for your point. <laughs> Is there any question from the internet? No, so at the end, thanks a lot. A big applause for Oscar and for this value input.